You know, we live in some pretty interesting times, don't we? And whether we realize it or not, they're, they're perilous times as well. This world that we are living in, it is, it is just changing at a torrential pace. And yet, you and I who are maybe a little bit older, we remember in our younger days hearing all the old folks talk about how fast the world's changing, right? Remember that? That's just what you do when you get old, right? The world is changing. They were right then, and we're right today as we look at this. I, I think of my grandfather's generation. Uh, they saw so much change. Uh, my grandpa was born in 1915. 1915, think back. Th that was the year the very first coast-to-coast -coast telephone call was made. Yeah, n not from someone's pocket either. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it, it was barely what we would call a telephone call, and it was an exceptional thing. And, and yet by the year 2000, when Grandpa passed, I, I remember having a cell phone in my pocket that could do this thing called text messaging. I really didn't like it, but, it, you know, it, it, was, it, it was something that was becoming available to us. And there, in fact, there was even a phone out. It, catch this. It had a camera in it. Is that crazy or what? What a difference between he, when he was born and when he died in the world and what things were like. And, and many of us, honestly, many of us are experiencing even greater change over the course of our lives. And some of us remember party lines. Remember party lines? And, and some of you, you're thinking of the wrong thing. It's not that at all. It, 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 it's this thing where you actually have to have a wire that goes to your house in order to use a telephone that's connected to the wall. And this, this telephone has this, this round thing on it that you would spin in order to designate to which other house, not person, but house, that you would then connect to make this call. But you see, there would be just one line for a couple of houses, and so if your neighbor's on the phone, you can't be. And then bring us up to today. Where not every home has a phone, but every pocket has one. Uh, some of them have two. And they're not really phones. They're, they're these miniature computers that happen to also make calls if we want them to. And they work not just when we're at home, not only where we go, but all over the globe. You, you can just travel from country to country with these things, and they still work. Now, it, it's kind of fun to talk about the changes in technology. I, I kind of geek out on that but far more consequential than the changes in technology are the changes that, that we have seen take place within our lives in regard to culture and morality. And back in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, uh, we saw things that had for long centuries been considered evil, being given uh, cultural and legal standing as being morally acceptable things, uh, things like divorce and abortion and uh, sex outside of the bounds of marriage. And not that any of these were new issues. No, history is full of that kind of stuff, isn't it? Uh, but how these things were viewed by culture and by law, it was beginning the process of changing. That which at one point had been called evil was now beginning to be declared as being acceptable. And then after a while, no longer were those things just acceptable. They were declared to be good things. Today, we see those things that used to be called good beginning to be called evil. Isaiah chapter 5 should, should sound a warning to us and to our day. There the Lord says this, woe. Uh, by the way, that word woe, it's a word of condemnation, not commendation, condemnation. It's a word that says stop. You don't want to go where this is leading. The Lord says, woe to those who call evil good and who call good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. You know, it's nothing new within our culture that the biblical morality is, is being rejected. That's not new. It's, it's not surprising. 
today much of what scripture categorizes as being evil is not only called good, but it's becoming protected by law, both here and around the world. And we're beginning to see that which scripture tells us is good begin to be declared to be evil. I don't know if you know this, but just a few hours to our north, uh, up in Canada, a new law went into effect yesterday. What this law says is that the Bible's teaching on sexuality and gender is now defined as a myth. It's a myth, and it has been declared to be harmful, and it is now illegal to express. Today in Canada, simply sharing what the Bible teaches can be a crime. This new law is so broad that... that that anyone who speaks biblical truth to those who are in bondage to sexual sin, uh, like homosexuality or transgenderism, even if that person wants to know what the Bible says, even if it's a mom or a dad uh, talking to their own child about the fact that the, the freedom from sexual sin can only, it can only come through repentance and faith in Christ. They could be sentenced to five years in prison. This isn't in some strange other realm. It's just a few hours north of here. And it's not just in Canada. It's many places here in the U.S. publicly teaching Romans chapter 1 would be considered hate speech. Even if what was said was said in love, was said with a broken heart, and with sincere humility. Living out a biblical Christian faith is no longer supported or encouraged by our culture. Rather, bit by bit, aspects of it are being declared outright illegal. Now, that may be an alarming reality for some of you. But let's get some perspective. Really, it's nothing new, okay? The church was birthed into a world that hated it. This is not a new dynamic. From the very beginning, Christians have lived amidst cultures where they were generally despised and regularly persecuted. Question is, question is, how should you and I respond to this dynamic in our day? Now that it's here for us, how should we respond? What should that look like? Should we live angry? just lashing out at this evil world at every opportunity? Or, or should we disengage? Uh, should we retreat, retreat from the world around us? It's a big question. I think we get part of our answer for it from our passage this morning in Luke chapter 20. Will you do this? Grab your Bible. Open up to Luke chapter 20. We're going to begin in verse 20. Luke chapter 20, verse 20. We'll read through verse 26. Will you do this? Will you stand with me out of respect for the word of God? I'll read our passage. I'd encourage you to follow along. Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 20. Luke writes, They watched closely and sent spies who pretended to be righteous so that they could catch him in what he said to hand him over to the governor's rule and authority. They questioned him. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly and that you don't show partiality, but teach truthfully the way of God. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But detecting their craftiness, he said to them, show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? Caesar's, they said. Well, then, he told them, Give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and to God the things that are God's. They were not able to catch him in what he said in public, and being amazed at his answer, they became silent. Let's pray. Father, I, I ask that you would have your hand upon us this morning. I pray that you would shake out the cobwebs. Give us the ability, Lord, to think clearly, to 
hear what you would say to us. And God, to respond to it. To be changed by it. Work in this time. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. As always, we, we've got to uh, remember the context into which the things that Jesus says here were spoken. If you remember, uh, Jesus has just uh, re-entered Jerusalem, what will be for his last visit during his earthly life. Uh, by the end of the week that he has begun here, he will be arrested, he will be tortured, and then he will be crucified. He began that, that final week, remember Palm Sunday, a grand entry, uh, cheered by crowds of his followers who were declaring the fact that he was the Messiah, he was God's Savior who, who had willingly come to be our atoning sacrifice. And then he, he went into the temple, and remember he cleared out all of the merchants who had very wrongly had set up their shops in one of the courtyards, a place that God had dedicated to those who would come to him to seek to come to know him. In response to that, the religious leaders, they challenged Jesus' authority. They demanded to know by what authority he had done these things, by what authority he had cleared out the temple courts. How could he justify overruling them? They had given permission to the merchants to set up there. Was he claiming to, to act for God? Or was he just acting on his own? Then Jesus told a none too subtle parable about a vineyard owner who got rid of his deadbeat tenants. A, a story that the religious leaders knew was Jesus' way of saying that God was about to get rid of them. They didn't like that very much. They especially didn't like it when Jesus ended the story by pointing to the main issue, to the main problem at hand. You see, they had rejected him. That was the problem. He was the Messiah. He was God's Savior. He was the eternal Son come in human flesh, but they had rejected him. He was the cornerstone that the builders had rejected. And then we come to today's passage, where the religious leaders try to trap Jesus uh, by asking what they think is an impossible question. Uh, the, the question is about paying or not paying taxes, but really what they're asking is, what is your governing authority? What is your governing authority? And that's a good question for, for all of us to consider. Who or what determines what you'll do? Especially when you are pulled in different directions. What determines which direction you will go. Will you follow the crowd? Will you obey the rules? What is it that masters or rules over you? Well, let's dig in. Look at verse 20. Uh, they watched closely. They sent spies, pretended to be righteous. As, and the whole point was that the, so that they could catch him in what he said, to hand him over to the governor's rule and authority. And so some of the religious leaders come deceitfully. They don't really have a question. They're setting a trap. And they're going to ask him something that they have decided has no safe answer. They, they are trying to put him in a predicament where no matter how he answers, they can use that answer against him. And so they start off in verse 21 by trying to butter up Jesus. Uh, teacher, uh, we know that you speak and correct uh, and teach correctly. They, they didn't believe that. Th they were going after him all the time. And yet here, oh, you are always right. And, and you don't show partiality. You're not afraid, afraid of saying the truth, even when it's controversial, Jesus. You see, these guys, they understand how stupid we tend to get when people feed our egos. And so the religious leaders try to feed Jesus' ego. But that's not going to work. It's not going to work. You see, flattery only works on those who give value to what others think of them or who put value on what they think of themselves. 
the people pleaser and the narcissist, when they're exposed to flattery, become nothing more than puppets yanked about, but not Jesus. And not Jesus. He only wants to do what pleases his father. Remember John chapter 6, there Jesus, he says it several times, several different ways, but he says this, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And Jesus tells us again and again, all I want to do is what the Father has given me to do. That's my only grid. That's my only goal. That's my only target. It's just to do what God has given me to do. I think we'd all be a lot healthier, wouldn't we? If we cared a whole lot less about what other people think, if we cared a whole lot less about what we think of ourselves, and we put the whole of our focus, the whole of our heart, at doing what God has called us to. Well, having wasted their flattery, uh, they present their question. It's a simple question. Look at verse 22. Is it lawful? Is it allowable for us to pay taxes to Caesar, to the Roman government, or not? And so the tax in question here, in that day it was called a poll tax, but basically it's a fee that says, I beat you. I, I, you belong to me. You must pay this tribute to me. I own you. It was paid by those who had been defeated by the Romans to their conquerors. And so even more than we hate paying taxes, they hated paying this tax. It was a reminder to them that they were owned by the Romans. Here are God's people who were supposed to belong to God and God alone, and yet here they are having to pay a tribute to their Roman ruler. And so the religious leaders, they knew. They knew that if Jesus said, yes, you should pay this tax, the people would hate that. I mean, who wouldn't? But if he said that they shouldn't pay the tax, well, then they could simply turn him over to the Romans, accuse him of rebellion. And so they thought they had him trapped. Look at verse 23. But detecting their craftiness, he said to them, show me a denarius. Jesus asks for a coin, a Roman coin, a coin that could have been used to pay this very tax. And he asks the question, whose image and inscription does it have? Caesar's, they said. Caesar being the title, uh, the person actually being Roman Emperor Tiberius, uh, that's whose face w would have appeared on the coin in that day and that time. And his name as well would have been stamped into the coin. And then Jesus says in verse 25, give to Caesar the things that are his. And give to God the things that are God's. It's interesting that Jesus here uses a different word for paying taxes than the religious leaders did. They talk about offering taxes, much like a, a, a tribute or, or an offering that would be a given to the gods. Well, Jesus talks about paying back that which is owed. He says, whatever you owe to the powers of this world, pay to them. But what you owe to God, give that to God. So Jesus says, do you use the roads? Are, are services provided? Then pay your taxes so that those things can be provided. But understand this. Everything you have. Everything you are, you yourself, you owe all of that to God. You owe a much higher debt to God than you could ever owe to anyone else. After all, he made you. He made you. He created everything that exists. It all belongs to him. All of creation belongs to God. But even in a greater way, you belong to him. 
because you see like the denarius bore Tiberius's image. You bear God's image. You go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. There God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. What does that mean? What does it mean that we're made in God's image? Well, in part, it means that unlike the rest of creation, you and I, we are eternal beings. C.S. Lewis put it this way, there are no ordinary people. You just feel like a kind of an ordinary person a lot of times. You feel like you just get lost in the crowd, and yet what Lewis says is true. He says there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Because you see, God has stamped his image on us. And that makes us valuable. That makes us incredibly valuable. Understand this. You may not see your value. Uh, others may not see it. But you have value because you bear the image of God. And so what is that image? In, in what way has he imprinted himself upon you? It's this. You are more than a body. You're more than a mind. Isn't it odd that we tend to choose to define ourselves by our body and by our mind? That that's how we identify ourselves so often. In fact, that's one of the greatest sources of our insecurities and our anxieties. And yet God's image, that part that sets us apart from the rest of creation, that part that makes us so intrinsically valuable, God's image is imprinted upon us in a, in a spiritual manner. Now, I'm not saying the physical and the mental don't have value. They do. God made us that way. He, he, he gave that to us. It, it is a good thing. But his mark upon us, his image, is something that is spiritual. You and I, we are spiritual beings, meaning that we are not limited by the physical. Every one of us, every person that you have ever met will live beyond the life of their physical body. The only question is, where and under what circumstances? And we've talked about this a lot lately, haven't we? It seems that as Luke wraps up his gospel, he is more and more focused on this whole message of salvation. Hey, what it comes down to is this. Will you submit yourself to God? Will you receive the gift of his forgiveness and mercy and as a result live with him forever? Or will you reject him, reject his mercy, reject his forgiveness? And find that he will honor your choice. He'll honor it for all eternity. And he will allow you to choose separation from the only and the eternal source of life. Being made in God's image also means that we belong to him. Because he made us. Remember what Colossians 1.16 tells us? That that all things have been created through him and for him. Did you realize that? Not only did God make you, he made you for himself. God's purpose in making you. You ever wonder what that is? You ever just think, well, God, why me? I mean, I think you could have done a lot better. You could have done something different than this. And yet God says, I made you for me. If you feel like you don't have a fit in life, that you, you don't fit in, you don't, you, you don't have your niche, it's because your niche is with him. It is in relationship with him. That is what he has made us for. He made us and he made us for himself. Not only is that true, but we are twice his. Because after God made us for himself and we rebelled against him, he has purchased us back to himself. He has redeemed us. The 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 reminds us, you are not your own. You 
were bought at a price. And what was that price? It's the death of Christ in our place, his payment for our sin. We belong to God. We belong to God, and therefore, he always has first claim upon us and upon our living. Our highest call, our first directive will always be to obey God. Yes, Romans 13 tells us that we are to submit ourselves to the governing authorities. Jesus says here, pay Caesar what you owe. It, it, Paul tells the Romans, submit yourself to the governing authorities. But understand this, there is a higher call, a higher authority, and that is to our obedience to God. And that's really the point for us here. Look at what we see in the life of Jesus. Jesus was not one who followed after public opinion, trying to figure out which way the crowd was going to go and then following with them. Nor was he a rebel. He didn't stand in this rebellious opposition against the authority of Rome. Nor did he see Rome as having the ultimate authority over him. I think we see this so clearly in his conversation with, uh, with Pilate and, and with Peter in, in the, whole, the whole thing that, that is about to play out before us. When Jesus is arrested by human government, he is questioned, beaten, mocked, eventually crucified. And he experienced all that, not because he was unable to free himself. Remember what Jesus said when he was being arrested, Matthew 26. He says, do you think I can't call on my father? and He will provide me here and now with more than 12 legions of angels. Peter, do you think this is happening because I can't stop it? Jesus says, no, I'm submitting myself to this. He submitted himself first to God, and then he willingly submitted himself to the governing authorities. It was all to achieve God's plan. But what do we do when the governing authorities demand of us something contrary? To what God commands. The answer here is not difficult. It, it, it's not complex, but it, it will prove costly. We're to obey God. We are to obey God every time. Like the prophet Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, remember them? I remember once I was in, in, in India uh, teaching at a Bible college and and I had this guy who was my translator. His name was Shadrach. I thought, well, that's kind of cool. And then a couple years later, I, I, I got the opportunity to go back. And I ended up at the same Bible college again. And they bring this, uh, this guy in to translate for me. And his name is Meshach. <laughs> and I thought that was so funny. And so I'm talking to this guy. I said, you're not going to believe this. But my translator two years ago, his name was Shadrach. He goes, oh, yeah, it's my older brother. You want to? You want to go meet a bed to go? He's one of the students. <laughs> okay, not those guys, not the Indian Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but the, uh, the Hebrews who had been captive there in Babylon. It, they were faced with a situation where they were commanded by Nebuchadnezzar to bow down and to worship an idol. What did they do when everyone else bowed down? They stood alone. They stood alone. And I think it's, it's so important for us to realize they stood alone not knowing what the outcome would be. They didn't know how this was going to go. They didn't know whether their God would rescue them out of the fiery furnace or not. That was the punishment. If you didn't bow down, you, you were thrown into the fire. They didn't know how it would go. They only knew what they had to do. had to obey God. Friends, there's, there's no official sanction against us today. But there will be. The word says that we will face trouble and persecution in this life. God's word is true. 
John 16, 33 tells us in this life we will experience suffering. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says that all who live godly lives will be persecuted. And our brothers and sisters in other places around the world, they will tell you, they'll tell us God's word is true. That has been their experience. The day is approaching, I think likely sooner than later, when we will be joining them in their experience, when holding to biblical truth will come at a cost. You'll pay a price. When obeying biblical mandates, it will mean very tangible loss. Most of the church already experiences this. We would do well to prepare ourselves to join them. And I don't mean build a bunker and buy more tuna. That, that, that's not what it means to prepare for this. Friends, we're ambassadors. We are to be his representatives. We're to be in the middle of the mix. We're to be with them, to be able to share the truth with them. So how do we prepare? We've got to prepare our minds and our hearts. We've got to draw close to the Lord. And think of what Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 16. He says, be alert. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. Don't miss this last part. Do everything in do everything in love. Let's decide now. Let's decide now to lovingly and humbly stand without compromise for the truth. Let's choose now to stand together. To stand together. He has called us to be a body. This is his plan. We didn't design it like this. This is, this is what he has said, is that we are to be together. Even when it comes at a cost. And let's commit today to honor and to obey God. To worry more about that than we worry about what others think of us or even what we think of ourselves. One last thought. It doesn't mean a thing to get all worked up about how we're going to do this when the culture and the government tell us we can't do it anymore if we're not doing it now. What would make us think that we will stand with boldness declaring the truth then if we're not standing with boldness declaring We need the Lord to strengthen us, to put resolve within us, to stiffen our spines and to make our, our feet sturdy, to cause us to stand no matter what comes. Let's pray. Will you guys stand with me? God, we stand up right now, and we ask, Lord, that as the days progress, you would strengthen and enable us to stand for you, Lord, to stand on your truth, to stand on the message of salvation. God, I pray that you would strengthen us that you'd pour out your spirit on each and every one of us, Lord. God, I pray that, that today, that tomorrow as we head into the week, we would stand. We would not relent. That we'd draw close to you, close to each other. 
we would encourage each other, we would lock arms. Lord, we would represent you well. God, I pray that you would wipe out any just angry, cranky attitudes, Lord, that towards this world and towards its evil. And Lord, that you would fill us with your love for the lost. Lord, that you would fill us with your heart towards this world. And God, that you would use us. Lord, this is, this is the sort of world that your church was birthed into, and it thrived. Show us, Lord. Show us how to do the thing here. Do in us what you did in you. Work in us, Lord. We pray it all in Jesus' name.